historic meeting of the Flat Earth Society. Uh, we are now going to be beginning. Perfect timing, Jim, right as the recording started. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, what is our version of that? <laughs> I don't know how to ask that question. It was rhetorical. Hi, Emily. Hi, Karen. So, are we doing announcements then? I have one. If so, can we move? Yes, to please. That? Yes. Um, just a reminder that we still have three more webinars in the clean um, professional development webinar series. So I just sent an announcement to remind folks about that this morning and thought I'd mention it in here as well. So um, please share that around if you know anybody who might be interested. I think that's all the clean news. We've scheduled a review camp, so we're having the next of those in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I think that's most of the news on the clean side. We had a, a live learning session last week for elementary students that went really quite well. I'm very happy about that. Um, it kind of ties in with our series, Science at Home learning sessions we had for students for older, um, but we did this one specially for elementary students as we launched the Clean Elementary Collection. So yeah, I think that's most of what's been happening on the clean side of things is that elementary launch and getting ready for this review camp and webinars, so. Hey, Katie, uh, one of the things I appreciated about the new innovations in the way clean works is the, the, the one link door into the elementary collection. Cause like clean is, it, you can, you have the teaching pages and then you have the collection and then you have supporting other, you know, the, 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 the way you did the, the one link. So there are definitely people who want to know about the elementary collection, but that one, which one link links for a thing and you've done a nice job in that so you just posted in the link that, that we're talking about so anybody yeah. who wants to go to clean for elementary go here and it'll unpack everything from there is that right yeah correct so the similar with the webinars where we have a series of webinars but try to keep them all on the same page as much as we can to kind of have one link to send out there and similar with like the teaching guidance how we kind of set that whole section up at the site we try to do that yeah similarly with the elementary so this is the link for clean elementary to share around with folks it includes the sort of guidance support pages that we've set up as well as links into um, the webinar that we have in a couple of weeks for teachers uh, elementary teachers and then a link to a uh, sort of separate collect clean collection that's just the elementary resources from clean. Um, so you can find those in there as well, sort of separate from everything, which is kind of nice. Yeah, as Frank mentioned, for those who want to really specifically target elementary teachers, um, this is a great link to send around for that. Perfect. I guess while, go ahead. Sorry. Can I ask a quick question while we're on the clean collection specifically about if anyone has had any um, pushback or, or challenges related to the racial justice statement being posted? Like if anybody has had any comment on it? Yeah, you know, Deb, I was kind of expecting that when we put that out there and I didn't, um, I didn't receive any pushback or hear of any, like Anna didn't mention any to me and none of the rest of the clean leadership has mentioned anything to me about it and I didn't get any response to it. Um, I actually didn't really get much positive or negative response to it, um, I think. So um, I wasn't sure exactly how it was uh, received in the community. So I'd be interested in hearing if other folks had thoughts on that as well. Deb, were you the person who raised this the other day that, that there was a school district that were, were pushing back on the use of the clean collection because of that statement? So many, I don't know where it showed up, but I have heard. It was me, yeah. Really, Deb, could you? I don't know if you have, I know you're trying to make food and eat. Could you um, elaborate? Like what, how did you hear that or what exactly happened? Like, um... yeah, I don't want to go into specifics on a recorded call, but, yeah. um, but I just wanted to note that, that, um, and maybe the more general statement of this is that there are at least, there is at least one teacher and there likely will be others, whether we hear about them or not, they're probably representative of, of a cluster who are working in spaces where there are conservative politics um, and those conservative politics are being somewhat conflated with um, sort of the, the 
either justice and or climate change education and potentially the intersection of them is not something that should be taught in schools explicitly. So mm -hmm. that was the, the justice part of that was uh, interesting pushback that I had not experienced before. I've of course experienced the pushback on climate change before, but the, the justice component was an interesting pushback in terms of centering racial justice as being politically aligned in a, in a particular way. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting thing. So I think it's just a reflection of the divisive rhetoric that we're hearing. And I don't personally think that that is aligned with one political party over another. I think that that is about the rhetoric that we're hearing in, in, from various areas, let me call it that. Well, that's an interesting point, too. And I wonder if maybe we could spend a little time, maybe not now, maybe as part of a informal or informal discussion today on these kinds of topics, because there were some emails that went around, too, about like um, from Don trying to advertise on Facebook. And I've heard this from Catherine Hayhoe and others that, you know, just putting climate into posts on Facebook can mark them as sort of political. And I wonder, yeah, I'm with Deb in terms of, you know, how do we kind of, I know that that's a, a lot of that is happening in this country, that kind of divisive and, and putting things into political boxes that maybe shouldn't necessarily be there. And I'd be curious to have a conversation or discussion around how do we try to combat that? What do we do about that? Yeah. You know, well, I'm, um, I'm hoping we'll talk about that a little bit today. Yeah. Our, our specific issue. Um, it's, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, um, it is a political issue because politics should deal with things that are important. And, figuring out how to um, deal with that in a way that <laughs> that doesn't stop people from talking about it is really important and pretty hard and made harder by uh, this kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, and you know, the, the specifics of this example is very, very time sensitive. If we're gonna do something that makes a difference, it's, it needs to be done in the next few days or the, the moment's gone. So, um, and I did just have a, a very brief conversation with a reporter who's um, going to write something short um, presently and maybe get something longer out. Uh, but uh, if you know reporters who would be interested in talk, talking to us about this, we love to do that because you know, we talked about writing a blog, we talked about um, doing an op-ed, but, uh, um, but this is a news story and uh, a news story will get more attention than those other things. Yeah, Don, if this reporter ends up writing a piece on this, I would definitely encourage um, them to reach out to Catherine Hayhoe because I've seen her post on Twitter about this before. Like she, um, you know, she's got a big following on Facebook and tries yep. to post things higher or, you know, get them out there. And I know she's been dealing with this for a long time, actually. So yes. she'd be a good person to talk to. Yep. And just so you know, my, my gut reaction would not be to design for the person who is resistant, it would be yeah. to design for the teacher to support them in continuing doing the work they think is important. Yeah. Exactly. Great. And that's a really good point, Deb, that I think um, that, yeah, I would, I wanted to kind of also bring up that I think with climate and climate change, that's been how we've managed it with teachers is really trying to um, help them give them tools and support for being able to talk to parents and or administration, um, but also, you know, giving them the support to think like for, for us, it's also a lot about like making sure like the climate science itself is not political. If you want to get into the salute, you know, right. kind of separating the solutions right. and consequences are different discussion in classrooms as well, you know, so giving them yeah. the tools to bring it into the classroom. Yeah. And I know Ginger is trying to get a word in. Oh, I, I know all this on climate and I just feel like that's what I'm missing, Dev, is the like, I don't know as much about it in the justice world and kind of how to, you know, do that with that topic as well. Sorry, Jim, go ahead. I oh, I was going to say, oh, oh Jim, ahead, I'll, yeah. I'll speak at you. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I was going to say, if you're doing, if you're trying to get press, I would um, suggest reaching out to the high country news. And they absolutely get the climate justice intersectionality and 
fires and drought and all of these things that the American West is experiencing in spades. And I think that they would be a good venue um, to just talk about the availability of these materials for teachers to be able to teach science. And, you know, one thing the other that, that bugs me a lot too is that there's been so much focus on STEM in the recent years and some of my school districts are so focused on STEM and a lot of the climate science is actually basic ecology, basic earth science. And if you take the foundational tools, the STEM stuff is kind of, can be kind of meaningless and over the kids' heads. So that's another thing is to always remind people that these are basic ecological principles, basic biology. Um, and so sticking to those things too might be a way to cap capture it. Yeah, and I, 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 I really see this as, uh, key example, key reason to reach out to the social studies and the um, English language arts teachers, because uh, it ain't just about the science. That's not, that's not what's stopping us from advertising. It's not the science that's stopping us from advertising. It's the politics. You know, I, I chime in that. Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, I chime in that this is a good example where we are the clean network. This is a network of different organizations and people who come from different points of view or you know, different places um, that different uh, among us, it's appropriate for or uh, okay for one of us to speak in one way and maybe not okay in another, right? I mean, clean as clean should do what it does. And uh, Don, you're representing a, a, a part of the network. Um, I, I represent another part, so we can each do different things. So I'm not speaking for the whole everybody, but for Don, kudos on going to the press right away on this. I mean, you know, it's a classic thing when something is censored. That's a news story, and you yeah. get more. You you have now elevated yourself potentially to the most prominent museum in the country on dealing on climate. You know, I mean, all righty then. You know, guy, you want you want to try and shut us down, and and, and it could even be, you know, of course, it could just be uh, a bot. I don't know. You know, I don't know the details of it, but it's a great news story. I'll definitely yeah. look over the news contacts of people we know who have been very good and kind of go over a little bit and see because they they send signals what they want to cover, what they don't want to cover. But I would certainly send along people that that have a good track record um, mm -hmm. to you if if it, if that fits on that. So really, kudos on that, um, and absolutely the same thing of like. The, the, on the racial justice and uh, and everything, you know, diff we can say different things. It, it, what's appropriate is is uh, appropriate given the circumstances and the place and the, that you're doing. But but I certainly would not be one to, you know, go ahead if you want to if you want to go after what we do because we believe in uh, diversity and in honesty and fairness and justice. It, to say we're wrong, you know. <laughs> Yeah. That's fine. We're going to keep doing it. But others, you know, in other other places, I mean, you know, I'm in California, Washington, D.C. It's like you can say things like that without really worrying at all. Right. So, thanks. So, so there's there's a there's a there's a piece of this that I, I want to untangle for us. Um, so if, if you remember and I'm not making this statement from a political perspective, I'm making it more from a from an argument perspective and then the social context. So if you listen to what Kamala Harris did in her questions of the Supreme Court justice that just got approved. And when she went through that very careful argumentation about is cancer, you know, I uh, remember what the first one was smoking, does smoking cause cancer? No, it's not controversial, right? But when she came to climate change, oh no, I can't say anything because that's controversial. And you and you understand what is what is it about the current moment that allows is climate change happening and are humans causing it to be controversial, which is why Facebook is saying we can't touch that because it's controversial. It's not controversial in the slightest. It is socially controversial, but it's not because the underlying reality is controversial at all. In fact, there's more certainty that humans are causing climate change than there is that uh, tobacco causes cancer. Just there on the record. But but the, the social dynamic is really what is most interesting here, mm -hmm. not, not the underlying reality. Yeah. Um, and I think pushing back on that, um, oh, that's controversial, sends really bad signals 
that are that are false. So uh, I, what I want to know is why is Facebook say you can't talk about that? Uh, is it because they they don't want to allow misinformation? They're not stopping misinformation. My reaction when not stopping the misinformation. My reaction when I read Don's email this morning was the good news is that climate change is part of the presidential campaign and election process this year for yeah, the first right. time. The bad news is Don's got caught up in that. Because but this Google's is getting Google, I know that. I've been involved in this since the beginning of clean. But but the the problem is the presidential election and Google's getting hammered right now in DC on on multiple fronts. And so they're trying to stay clear from the controversies of the presidential election, I believe. Yeah, I think that's right. So I, I want to play devil's advocate here for a moment on something. One of the dilemmas with the last election was the amount of misinformation that was thrown around in social media. Yeah. And so we've, we've spent the past four years trying to untangle ourselves from that. And I wanna sort of, sort of building on what Karen's comment is that Don got caught in something. And I, I, I am just wondering that if we are going, I mean, if Clean chooses to challenge this in some way or, or some of us choose to challenge it, I'm thinking that we've got to deal with the fact, well, if you're shutting down the Face Boys, uh, I mean, the Proud Boys, and you're shutting down all of these other groups, uh -huh. why is it so unreasonable that, you're shut it, that, that you folks are being shut down? I mean, I know the answer to that one, but I think it's something that, that they have to grapple with. Yeah, yeah, and, well, it's a hugely complex issue. There's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, if, uh, if they were effective at stopping the misinformation on climate, <laughs> I wouldn't be so offended that they were <laughs> stopping some of the, information, the actual information. Right. Um, that's what I'm getting at right there. Politics rather than actually doing bona fide research. That's right. <laughs> and and, I, and I, would, I, just... I would agree too. I would agree too. I've had to, uh, had to deal with uh, social media. I, I don't know if people know about next door, but there's, there's another yeah. thing where and it was about trees and in Oakland where I am and, and so on. And a lot of it was, was getting this massive problem. And it was right before 2016, with with the last election, that what the what the what the social media were saying is we we are not responsible for whether or not what is told is a lie or not. We're not concerned about truth and factuality. So if you're bringing up something factual and they've got ten people who are saying absolute lies, we're going to shut you down because. Because you're because they've got ten people who are we know they're telling lies, but we're trying to have as many people on our network as possible, so we're going to shut you down when what you're telling is factual. I mean, this this thing of social media is removed anything like journalism. So I, I, anyway, I, I I I don't disagree with anything that any of the different people are saying. We're saying all these different aspects of it. So. Mm -hmm. there there's an interesting... Uh, can I just get a clarification on what the issue was that was emerging from Dawn's space? Yeah, I'm, uh, I was a little confused by your question, which is why I hadn't answered it yet. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have this brand new um, online exhibit, which went live about a, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, um, that is uh, um, a version of a physical exhibit that will open in a few weeks uh, at the Museum of the Earth. And so um, we are, were attempting to advertise that on Facebook and um, got rejected because of this um, policy from Facebook about advertising political and social issues too close to the election. Does that answer your question? But 
I just wanted to clarify that I've also heard this from other folks, not to do with the election. Like this is something that's been yeah. going on Facebook for years now. And mm -hmm. just to clarify what Jim was saying around it, like the reason <clears throat> misinformation can still spread is because folks can still post things, right? Like we right. all can post things on Facebook. Our friends can share it. It gets around that way. What Don's trying to do is bump up the view. Right. Like he's trying to pay Facebook to advertise advertise to market his deal and that's where they shut it down and say no claim it's a political issue and they've been doing that for years that's not just to do right. with this election that's something that a lot of climate change folks have been dealing with on facebook for a long time if you want to market it that's when the problem comes yeah they they have um they they do have a election time specific policy um, i'm not they sure do how they this do year yes yeah. I'm not sure how that's different from their prior policy, but I do know that it's new. This, the election was the new content. You can't post any new content within the two weeks around the election, right? That's true, Don, that is different. So- But I think, okay, go ahead, Patrick. Thanks. Um, I wanted to, to throw it out there is one thing that might be useful in responding to this in the media, um, from my perspective, is that you had a system of media communication that evolved from a place where kind of anything could be said, then there was a real focus on balance in reporting, um, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then we realized that balance can be bias, looking at some of uh, Max Boykoff's work and the work that I'm involved in at CU. And so you had this evol evolving system where we had to come to terms with balance as bias. And mainstream media has largely done that, mainstream publications. We're finishing some work now looking at the last 15 years compared to the 15 years before that. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that um, social media hasn't gotten there yet and we're seeing the same issue play out in a way that shows that the lessons from mainstream media haven't been learned so that you had a space where anything could be said and there was a lot of bouncing back and forth and now they're in the balance as bias phase where they're like no, no no we can't say that so we can't say that and i think pointing out the way that mainstream media has evolved past that compared to the way social media hasn't might show pathways forward for them to reconsider those uh, practices. Really important point, Patrick. Yep. Really, I mean, can you share that literature that Max has got? We just finished two years of analysis. We are uh, putting this into Nature Climate Change at the end of the month. Once I have a preprint, I'm glad to share it. Perfect. Great. That's a really That'd important great, point, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. But. but uh, we can, we crossed we crossed a, a topic earlier in this conversation. I think Don, you raised it, and I want to I want to bring us back to it if it's okay. We can always go back Emily to the wants to to get a word. Who? In. Emily, Who? all right, Emily. Sorry, I'm, you know I'm going to go on a uh, gallery view because that, that's not working for me with speaker view. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Just I'm missing I'm missing all the signals. That's what I'm trying to say. Thought, I just wanted to say, um, Patrick, I. Um, I think that whatever we're going with the ACE framework from this needs to take exactly those issues and how we coordinate across the social media and the news media and the narrative media as part of the process. I think functionally, structurally, that has to be part of whatever our plan is next. Yeah, anyway, go ahead, Frank. Sorry, now I can see everybody. Sorry about that, Emily. Uh, I was, that's why I was tone deaf, because um, I was blind. Um, the, the point that is um, about the, the which, which disciplines um, we're talking about is a really, 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 really important topic for us. And historically, the bones of clean as in a collection and the portal were focused on science. And most of the work of the first, I don't know, 2008, when we started to, you know, recently was on science and all the work we did on the NGSS and NRC framework, and it was all science. But uh, you know, over the past few years, the emergence of other 
disciplines as being critically important to what goes on in schools and learning. So I just want to, for the record, say that, that, that if that is a concurrence of the community, we need to prioritize the clean building and focusing on non-science disciplines going forward, as opposed to just the sciences um, that would require reprioritizing funds, reprioritizing tasks. Um, and the question is, are the other disciplines ready? Meaning there's materials out there that um, we would find if we started making that a priority. Yeah, well, you know, the National Council of Teachers of English has a book on teaching about climate change in the language classroom, and they have a position statement. Um, so uh, there is, there are things going on out there. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we could, there, that book is co-authored by uh, four folks, um, uh, but it, it'd be good to have them on and, and give us a talk. They are aware of clean. Um, I agree. And, uh, um, Jim D'Amico at uh, University of Indiana, I think, is a social studies edu teacher educator who um, uh, works on climate change issues. Uh, so that there are there are things out there, and I, uh, some of you have. Oops, that's not what I meant to paste. I don't know why that did that, but there's my cell number if you want to call me. Um, <laughs> That's good to know, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's a compilation of resources on uh, interdisciplinary uh, stuff that uh, on teaching climate change. Um, so, Frank, you can guess already that I'm totally supportive of what you said. That it, I think we need to be there. I think that's there. It's been a, a lot coming. What Climate Change Education at Dark does is a, is a very small piece, but just adding our piece in it. Um, with, the, with the school, little school, a, a lot of what we're, what we're currently doing on that is there is the mobile climate science lab where the students, most of the students are volunteers with that. And that focuses on science, education, science, and STEM-based action. That's its focus, and that's where we do and what we're at the science festivals. But it was a very big step forward that, that um, there's Climate Club DC. So it's a group that's not that's starting a little, but also is now spreading to other schools in the DC area. And that has the much more open the students' ability to speak what they want to speak. They are not restricted to science. They can speak on social issues. They can make videos that are just, I'm angry about this, <laughs> you know, that I want to do things. And, it, and that's where the social studies and the language arts teachers uh, come in a lot. And, and then they're branching out and working, you know, connecting with the other student organizations, some of which, some of the, you know, the youth summits are very political, right, which I, I tend to not get into. But there's, there's quite the whole range and, and, you know, giving students different ways in which they can speak in art. So I know it's a small piece, but I think uh, we're not just speaking from the top down or adults to kids. The kids are doing the same coming back up. Okay. Em, you were saying something? Yeah, if I can add to that, <clears throat> it's gonna be amusing because I'm gonna be the cautionary voice here. Um, so I would actually say that we have to also ask ourselves the question, what is it that science learning specifically provides into the equation of understanding what we are doing and, and what we're experiencing around climate change and what our options are going forward that is different from the other disciplines. And so like it's, uh, and, and this is coming from somebody who absolutely thinks we should be teaching from a climate justice lens in science classrooms, but not necessarily how to be, um, well, I want to think about how to be a scientist through writing, through math, through history, not how to be a historian who might know a little bit about science. So I want to center science in the work and then think about how to pull those other disciplines into the space. And it's an interesting balance. So like the work was in education project that's going on in Washington state. They're the people who published the Earth's curriculum for a guide or curriculum for the earth or something like that, climate change curriculum for the earth. 
I can't think of the title off my top of my head, but, and it's a social studies curriculum. And the idea is like, how could we actually center some of those activities and work on science, like learning the science, but then engage action and, and planning work as part of the uh, justice-centered phenomena of, clients lear of climate learning around those types of things. And so it, it's a balance that we're struggling with in Washington state, frankly, like in terms of like, where is the balance between politically indoctrinating students, which is never the goal in a science classroom, hopefully any classroom, you know, that, but, but what instead we're trying to do is how do we create those deep critical thinking skills that intersect scientific knowledge and the use of that knowledge for democratic practices, for engagement um, with community, for building a better future. And so I do, I think it was, might've been James who was talking earlier, I couldn't quite see on my iPad, but like, I do really think we are the adults in that space. And while youth movements and things bring, it, bring up a lot of in ways in which we might wanna to connect to youth movements, we still need to ground them in understandings of science. That being said, understandings of science themselves are intercultural. And I think that's the piece that with the justice statement for clean that we're not always getting clear. So those cultural differences that exist on all different dimensions, how do we connect with community with different cultural ways of being and doing science? Not just ways of being and doing, but doing science in other ways. Anyway, that was long-winded, sorry. No, that, uh, that was a very, uh, I, how should I say? It was, uh, you worded it very nicely. I, I had a professional development uh, experience that I did uh, three weeks ago with a group of pre-service teachers from Kentucky. And I was very surprised because there were lots of uh, social studies focus as well as uh, uh, language arts focus candidates there. And there, as I got to know them, uh, this is what I heard from them. Um, learning about data and whose data has it been traditionally and which were the groups that were marginalized is a very much social science topic. And then how has that data been used to inform decisions that tend to be scientific is it shouldn't be just science or scientists saying that this is our, our area, it becomes uh, everybody's area. So uh, here, hearing that, I mean, they, they had, a, we did a, a session on data literacy learning about how to analyze uh, data, what are the things that we can do before we come in, talk about uh, global climate change as a socio-scientific issue. And I think, um, reflecting on that experience, I mean, uh, I'd be very supportive of this uh, uh, clean developing those resources and uh, interdisciplinary resources. Those that were from the language arts, uh, the pre-service candidates, they were very much interested in writing. How do we write about this? Um, a controversy only happens when it is, when a, a true controversy is when, when two, there are two sides of a story. And this is something that we've experienced in Nebraska when we started our Global Climate Change Literacy Project here in 2017. And there were, there were, I think, five students in a classroom that would come up with a book. I forget the title of the book, but it was like, climate change is a hoax and they would not say anything. They were high school students and that book would stay on their table as the class would go on. And the teacher was very, very supportive of it. I was the uh, observer and I observed all the uh, lessons. Teacher was very supportive of it because she would say, write an essay for me, write and quote this book and write an essay for me. And and one of the students did. And by the end of her instruction, that was about four weeks, the student was questioning in his essay that 
I was hoping to be political about this issue, but that moment hasn't come. We've been so invested in science and data that even I forgot that where was the controversy because the data was so, so much, you know, it, it was so much for them to understand and, and do the assignments and think about it where we're reading trends. Oh, we, what's this? What instruments are we using? So, and that's exactly was the point that the teacher made in the end that controversy happens when you understand an issue. That's only when you say, okay, I support it. But when you don't fully understand it, how do you go come up and say it is a controversy? So that was a good experience. And I really enjoyed the way our teachers handled it by welcoming the students' opinions. Okay, you don't have to agree with me. Uh, we are here to learn what this, what this is about. If scientists are saying temperatures are average surface temperatures are increasing. Let's learn why they say so. How did they analyze their data? And who collected this data? So in answering those questions, if you keep going down as to who collected that data, that's very much social science <laughs> as to who gets to collect that data and why were those decisions made. And then it's nature of science as to how was this data analyzed? What are the processes? So anyway. Um, I might mention in our community, we don't, we haven't recently had people from National Center for Science Education on. They have some very, very interesting perspectives on this. I mean, being in the Bay Area, I get to talk with them and things a lot. I know that uh, one of the people who's moved on to go back to the Catholic schools and teach, but he, I know he said in the conferences that he really would warn us about getting involved in social, uh, the social sciences, as the social sciences have more thing of you kind of, well, you have one point of view, you have to have another point of view, and they tend to do that. I don't know if I would go, I, I don't, I don't think that's the, what you do. I mean, I think you, you engage and you do it and you, and you work on it. But I, I, mean, I figured they've really looked at it and they do have some interesting perspectives. So just as, you know, to the extent we're go, we find ourselves in this area, I would invite National Center for Science Education to be part of it. By the way, they were one of two sessions at the Bay Area Science Festival that just wrapped up the virtual one. And the other was by a youth group, uh, the Bay Area Youth Climate Summit. But it just uh, an, an interesting intersection uh, because both of them were more social sciences than they were science, even though it was a science festival. So uh, this is very lively in, Oak, in California right now. Just to throw it out there on that note, you know, if, if there are people that you're seeing aren't here and you would like to be, please send me their contact info along with the topic you'd like to hear them um, check in with us about. And I'm more than happy to reach out and see if they're up for presenting. So love to follow up with anybody y'all would like to recommend. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. Emily, do you want to go first? Yeah, just real quick. Um, you guys are talking about science standards and controversy in classrooms and all this. And I, um, it's kind of a side note, but one of the conversations that I've got going locally is how we can integrate the climate and health information better in our community. And um, one of the ideas that a couple of science writers and I, and a, one of the local doctors and I are playing around with is um, contacting the school nurses and seeing if that can be part of the education content from the school through the school nurses through in, in our county. Um, just tossing that out there in case anybody has other ideas or thoughts or about that too. It's a different direction. So one, one thing I want to point out is I put in the chat the, the Making the Grade report that came out from NCSE. I imagine most of you saw that. Some interesting things to note is that while all the work we did in clean to support the NGSS and the NRC framework to have a strong climate component to it, um, there's an there's a interesting way of looking at the table um, that is, uh, you know, the grading the states. Um, and you see uh, NGSS states tend to be a B plus. Um, and one of the areas where they kind of nicked them some was civic participation. So even the NGSS and their analysis is it's got some issues in the civic participation side, which is really important to note. But then 
If you look at all the states that are not, what do they call it, non-framework states, um, their grades are incredibly low. Um, so clearly the NGSS and NRC framework had a significant improvement in the sciences. Um, so let's just call that as success to some degree. To some degree uh, we have yes. more work to do. We got yeah, way more work to do. Don't get me wrong. I, I remember March Madness. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's worth noting that those are the standards and the standards and the practices may not be all that closely aligned. I mean, New York State exactly. got a B plus for um, being, I think it got a B plus anyway, for being one of the NGSS states. But the reality is that um, that hasn't filtered into the classroom in any substantial way as yet. And I am leery as to what it'll actually look like when um, new assessments are developed that are supposedly NGSS aligned. It actually got an A minus, uh, Don. Yeah, yeah, right. which I, I, am, I am a little leery of. Well, the standards are great, right? Yeah. But, but get right. the standards. Like that was our first major push, right? Get the standards. We got the standards. Yeah. Now what happens in the classrooms and what gets assessed in the classrooms is a whole nother set of work. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Ginger, you look like you had your hand up. Oh, just before I forget, Emily, I don't, I don't know what state you're in, but in Washington, our nurses don't teach health at all. So we, but we do have health requirements. I believe they get a quarter or semester in middle school and another quarter or semester in high school. I would just look at the teaching standards and figure out who teaches those. And oftentimes it's the coach, like uh, it's the PE teachers that oftentimes are also the health teachers, or if they have a, if the school still has home ec, sometimes those teachers, at least in our area, are the ones. But I mean, home ec, if anybody's teaching that, if you're living with a drought, how do you garden? You know, what are you doing around your house? So we could, we could be incorporating this stuff everywhere. Yeah, and actually, uh, if you look at that um, list of interdisciplinary resources that I posted, the uh, International um, Home Economics Forum, and I don't, I don't know what happened because the pandemic, but their the theme of their conference this year was sustainability um, or something along those lines. Um, but like I said, I, it's been a while since I put that in there, and. Uh, and the world changed since I wrote the document. So the theme for the 2020 International Federation for Home Ec Economics World Contra Congress was home economics soaring towards sustainable development. So I think that's interesting, though I don't know anything really beyond the title of it. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I could mention something, if I, I, I think many of us have seen Amy is chiming in with really good stuff um, in the chat. Um, uh, maybe cr uh, bringing a couple things together. Um, uh, I had a nice dialogue with Katie, hi Katie, and, and Anna, of what happened at the California um, Association for Science Educators, used to be called CSTA, um, where overwhelming the sessions were saying that they were on board with it, it's appropriate to introduce uh, education uh, science that relates to climate change in elementary school but there were a couple sessions that were still very admonishing teachers not to touch it and that was more controversial and anyway it, it generated the, the thing of having the clean network or the, excuse me the clean resources have a presence at CSAE next year which I do promise Katie to get exactly when the op it's the opening and when the things are. Where, where I'm kind of going with this is, is there anything, Amy, on, uh, you know, whether through chat or whatever, of having a, a, a relation of what uh, Tenstrands is doing and clean in, in that process of maybe a joint session or at least coordinating a little bit? And what I would say is the, the, that conference, the California Association of Science Educators, is a good conference to – regularly make a connection up to clean because what happens in California is very important. Um, and, you know, that there's a sort of, you know, we want to make sure clean's represented and then what comes out of that um, come back to clean and, and be part of what goes on in the national dialogue. Anyway, I mean, it's a, what you all do at 10 strands is extremely important to us, um, Amy, and not to, not to have you sidetrack from working with clean when it comes to these conferences. 
I'm not sure if what hi. <laughs> I'm not sure what your question was, but I'll be happy to answer it if there is one. Well, it, it's it, t- taking that conference in particular. I mean, more, even if it's just an example, if Clean will look to have more of a presence next year, at least that, that's that's the discussion, and specifically around the elementary school uh, curriculum. Is there any because you're chi- you're chiming in with what Ten Strands is doing, what Oak, uh, California does in general? I'm just kind of making. Uh, would there be a, a dialogue between Ten Strands and the Clean Resources of coordinating at least, if not working together at, at such a conference with the idea that it's making breakthroughs for the whole country, right? What we do in California can help other parts of the country and the controversies that happen in California inform other controversies. So kind of, maybe I also say, Amy, welcome. Let's, let's make sure your program is, is integrated in here. You are just doing such important work. Thank you. Yes. And I, you know, also definitely take back what I hear from you guys about what's going on nationally and in other states to, you know, think back about what's going on in California as well. Yeah, and Jim, I mean, we can definitely be in conversation as we plan for next year to, you know, do a conference presentation, who and all we should in- involve with that and coordinate on or collaborate on it with. So yeah, great point. I want to throw some into the mix uh, um, in this realm of uh, teaching and, um, and other disciplines and how we're going about things is I've been looking across a, a really broad spectrum of uh, climate resources in the both formal and informal realms that you know most of y'all are familiar with and have looked at different sets of how to do this and how to teach that and how to communicate this. But something I, I see a whole lot of is that the majority of these resources are focused on how to teach topics to a group or how to talk about climate change to a group and how to be an authority figure presenting yourself as, a, it's a hierarchical, relationship in there too that gets formed. And I've really been thinking about and focusing on flipping that paradigm of what does it mean to facilitate conversation rather than communicate to? What does it mean to communicate with? And I I think that's something we're, we're missing a hell of a lot of in both formal and informal realms. And there's some good stuff on it, but it's not the most common stuff. Um, and especially it, we've got this weird system in classrooms where in the system that we're in with standardized testing, with given sets of requirements, it's very much like give the students this information so they can give it back in a format that we can test. But we don't have a lot of formats that value starting good conversations in classrooms. We don't test students on it. It's not a requirement in systems that I know of. And so flipping these paradigms to focus on communication and discussion and how to do that, I think we need a lot of work on it. And I don't know how to transition fully in in the formal education space because it's a system shift of values. But in the informal, I think there's a lot of ways we can go about it. Yeah, and I'll... I'll... Go ahead, then I'll go. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll note our Facebook ad that got rejected was uh, um, focused on uh, helping people talk about climate change. Um, and uh, the exhibit has good attention to that. And um, most, much of our programming, all the programming that I'm directly involved with that we do, um, I early in my uh, in the session, I deputize the audience as climate change communicators, whoever they may be, whether that's high school kids or whoever. So that's, uh, I agree 100%. Deb, go ahead. 
So there's a couple of different groups that have worked on like how to have climate conversations guides. So, you know, like climate outreach has done one. And I just saw another one come around from, oh, I know where it was. It was an organization in Canada. I'll put the link in the chat in a second. It was Carrie Pike, Frank. Um, her work had done a guide like that. And so those things I think are available in the world. The question is like, the practices that we're teaching students to engage, engaging in argumentation with evidence, engaging in communication and multiple forms of communication, those are actually in the standards now and they are starting to unfold as people implement NGSS. Um, and we're hitting lots of places where teachers are struggling to figure out how to support those conversations as they hit up against politics, hit up against like um, different forms of knowledge, scientific knowledge. And so um, that's where we're starting to get the rub inside classrooms. I would say of classrooms that are moving fully to NGSS implementation, that's happening. Um, but that's the question, is how many of the classrooms are really moving toward full implementation. So I'm gonna build on Deb's point. That's exactly where I was trying to get to in formal instruction is that emphasis on practices. And we haven't adopted um, NGSS. We have Nebraska state standards, which were rewritten here. But the emphasis on practices also came into these standards. Uh, one particular practice that my uh, research papers have focused on is the scientific modeling, use of models, both representative, computational, um, different kinds of models. The other one is asking questions, and the third one is argumentation. All three of these practices have built in uh, ways to flip the equation in a classroom from science being given to science being created. The challenge that teachers face is to how to initiate this, these practices. They understand the theory of it, but when it comes to you're in the 38 minutes and you have to get going, finish an activity, do the end discussion at the end and also set up for investigation, that leaves you with a 10 minute or eight minute window of asking just the right question or just the right hook into the activity. So as a curriculum developer, it has become a necessity for us to provide a teacher scaffolding guide or a guide to teachers for here are the questions. And here is the potential discussion prompts. And so guiding in, so for example, in use of, uh, for, for this particular curriculum that we developed here and used, it's a computational model curriculum we gave the questions to ask before a certain lesson, which was, how do you think the temperature anomalies are collected or temperature data is collected all across the world? Where does this data come from? And it sets up for that particular day, not the entire curriculum. So that, that level of professional development is needed is that where we are providing scaffolding that particular day, a particular section of conversation. And, and, and then teachers start to get that, that, they get in the habit of using or leveraging these practices. And I have seen the flip in the classroom in becoming more democratic, I would say, it's like students creating knowledge. But it, is, it, is a, it takes a lot in the front end to get there. But it's possible. I, I got a hope. I got hope from that. <laughs> Something I, I could add. If um, uh, again, if we're just we're what we do at Lowell School and Climate Club DC is an approach, one of many approaches. But what it does is enable the students to actually they are climate educators, climate science educators, and other forms now in a meaningful, serious way by finding the platform, the venues that they can do it with areas that they're going to be able to teach something that is actually going to be more effective than an adult or a scientist even doing. And so immediately they are not just receiving information, but they're learning to process it, which by the way is incredible for language arts. 
they want to speak, they want to email, they want to do videos, they want to do things while they're learning. So, I mean, it's just if, if we can just be know that we're there as one little example among many, and wanted to look up with others, of the kind of things we're talking about, we're using our freedom to to actually implement these, that the students are themselves climate educators, science educators, and in other ways. So, and it's and the kids love it. I mean, it really is fun. I want to build on what, what Jim just said, and I, and I want to flip this conversation a little bit. Um, Kristen Poppleton's been uh, relentlessly asking me for a, a, a statement that I made, and she's like, where's the evidence of that statement? And the statement is the following. What students want to learn is at least 50% focused on climate solutions and building the skills and practices to be able to implement solutions way more and that's their that's their that's what they're settled at meaning that they're willing to accept 50 percent problem 50 percent solution they'd rather higher solution than problem but what they're now getting is something like 90 percent problem if anything um and very very little connection to solution in their curricular time and so i think one of and i'm seeing some reactions here so I don't know how we build out the case and the evidence for this. And if there's literature out there that's in this space, I would love to see it. The closest I found was Tony Lazarowitz's uh, work in 2016, but we got to have better data and more current. But my point is, is that if we, if we say, and, and I'm coming back to John Paul Mejia last week in, in the um, ACE dialogue, we were launching the community review and what he was saying from a Sunrise Clio Institute perspective was completely in line with this. But I think that we don't fully understand what our students want to learn and what they want our education system to focus on relative to what we think that we should as opposed to what they want. And I, I think we need to listen more to the students, especially the ones who are in strikes Sunrise Movement, a lot of the activists, they are really, really frustrated with, with the way schools are just incremental at best changing here. And um, so uh, I'm chewing up a lot of bandwidth and I'm sorry, but, but I think we got to get better details on that because they, they want to go way faster than we are getting them. Frank, would it be okay if the form in which the students communicate with us, our videos and you know, of them speaking for them in their own voice and, see, and yes. showing what they do, because they yeah. communicate well that way. And, and even yeah, if you had to ask them the same I, question, right? I, One question. Sorry, Don. Well, I, I heard on NPR last week that TikTok has twice as many users in North America as Twitter. <laughs> so we can ask them. And I, I have another meeting that I've got to jump off to, but thanks very much. This has been very, very helpful. Bye-bye. Yes, Frank G, jump in. Yeah, uh, Frank, you know, uh, one thing I do with my students every, every week is we have a weekly summary, which is they go over the guiding questions for the week. And then they also, I give them space to ask two questions in regards to um, the the content the content of the course, either what was said in lecture or um, what was said in books and so on, and um, that has oftentimes been a great medium for discovering what the students really value, because I get a lot of questions about what's the solutions. And I would be, since I'm not the only one who teaches this course, I would be happy to orchestrate something at least at Portland State where maybe we could do a little bit of preliminary research right. to provide some foundation for your question, for your, your statement. Yeah, uh, anything we can do to build the evidence case, I know this is true. I've heard it across the country, all over the place, but we don't have a, a more systematic way of get, gathering this yet that I'm aware of. Yeah, well, certainly certainly within the university studies at Portland State, maybe reaching out to Lewis and Clark and, and some of the other places, I can talk to people in the network and see if we can set up sort of an informal 
or or sure. a, a preliminary, not an informal preliminary. Yeah, yeah preliminary. I like that. Gathering. Unfortunately, I have to jump to another meeting that I'm uh, three two minutes late for. But uh, I, I'm we got to make progress here. Yeah, we should talk more about this. I think uh, this would be another good focus topic for a future conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank yes. you. It's 102. So I guess we should pause the recording.